talk a little bit about immutable Kubernetes, which uh, we refer to as a shift left pattern. And I'll discuss a little bit about uh, what I mean by shift left and how that refers to immutable infrastructure. Um, this uh, conversation today is going to be based around some of the uh, capabilities of the digital rebar provision uh, open source uh, provisioning service and a little bit about Rackn as a company that proctors and manages that open source project. But primarily, this is uh, purely around the uh, digital rebar open uh, components and what we've done to make Kubernetes deployments immutable. Um, my name is Shane. Uh, I'm an architect and engineer uh, and also a community evangelist and run meetups for Rackn and the online digital rebar meetup group. Um, I have a lot of experience in infrastructure technology uh, dating back to, uh, gosh, my equipment experience dates back into the late 70s when I was in the United States Marine Corps running and operating mainframe computer equipments that were 15 to 20 years old uh, at the time that I was in the Marine Corps on up into Unix systems, network engineering, network architecture, systems architecture. I've, uh, my experience has spanned sort of a, a large gamut of the uh, technology stack, which I think has really helped me uh, with foundational provisioning technology solutions. Uh, Rackin and Digital Rebar is a company that's been around in one form or another for quite a while. Uh, basically, it has an eight year history going back to Dell, who originally founded um, a project within Dell to support very large customer deployments. And when I say very large customers, typically on the order of 10,000 physical machines or more. And uh, through the process, uh, the original founders of Rackn, through that process, they learned um, deploying is something that is typically very inconsistent from system to system, from uh, company to company. And there's a lot of manual work and it's a tremendous amount of overhead for a lot of organizations to be able to do uh, consistent, automated, and repeatable um, provisioning. They found that by doing, um, by applying strong automation patterns, that a lot of those problems go away. And a lot of the provisioning systems and use today don't really uh, operate around automation patterns in sort of a modern cloud native way, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about immutable infrastructure, which is one of the patterns that was a strong learn, uh, learning experience, which is sort of the apply, rinse, repeat, or create, destroy, recreate sort of pattern. But first, let's talk a little bit about immutable infrastructure. Uh, a lot of people have different ideas about what immutable infrastructure is and, and what it means to them. And for the most part, um, all of those differing views are probably right. So what we like to do is just sort of level set a little bit on what we refer to as immutable infrastructure and what that means to us. For us, immutable in infrastructure is essentially uh, replicating the cloud and container pattern, which is that create, destroy, recreate pattern. So typically uh, in cloud or containers, you create an AMI, a QCOW, a VMDK, uh, or a container, image of some sort and you bake in a bunch of stuff into those things and you deploy it. How you deploy it is a little bit different, but the basic operation of give me this thing, instantiate it and make it whole, go and do it, is sort of that, that create destroy pattern. When I'm done with it, destroy it, spin up a new version or a new revision with updated pieces and parts to it. Uh, it should be noted that simply because uh, we define immutable, it doesn't mean that the uh, image or the thing being deployed doesn't need to be configured. Uh, in an immutable provisioning environment, you still need to be able to do one-time configuration of um, basic runtime information that might be things like IP address, your DNS servers, NTP servers, might be the cluster you should uh, join. It might be some secrets that are injected into the application. It might be a join command uh, of some sort. But typically, that's a one and done pattern at instantiation of the image or the service being created. It's not a continuation of um, patch, update, patch, update. 
So what this basically means is it sort of shifts to the left. If you look at our dev, CI, CD, pre-production, prod pipeline, which is kind of a standard pipeline that you see in most production environments. There are variations to this. There are different stages to it for different people. But essentially, this pattern means that we shift configuration, update, and patching from the left side of the, the, the screen, which is the production side. And we do that more in dev and CI CD. And we create the this snapshot or this Polaroid picture of what our system should look like. And we roll out that snapshot or that picture of what the production system should look like instead of creating a production system, configuring it, update, patch, update, patch, update, patch. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And there are a couple of different patterns that uh, immutable provisioning supports. There's the traditional package-based installation methodology, which a lot of people are familiar with when they talk about automating uh, provisioning systems. And that's something like using repos, uh, kickstarts, pre-seeds, uh, traditional sort of define what I want configured methodology. Uh, immutable provision can very much encompass package-based patterns. It's just we're shifting to the left where that configuration is done in creating and building our uh, environment or our configuration or our information for our final production environment. The ultimate sort of pattern uh, is the image-based deployment where you create sort of a raw image. It might be a tarball of a file system, a Windows image-based, uh, WIM-based image component, which you then actually just hydrate that image on the target machine. And then with extremely little uh, post uh, instantiation, configuration, one-time configuration is done. So that there, those two different patterns can both be encompassed in what immutable is in our methodology and our design uh, consideration. Um, some of the things to, to touch on is, like I said, it's, it's not a zero configuration pattern, but it's a run once configuration pattern, post boot initialization. It's important to note that um, because a lot of people get hung up on the idea of immutable being completely unchanging. And unchanging is not actually the case in, in real production environments because you always have some post uh, configuration that needs to be done. Um, the more complex your environment gets, the more benefits you have to the immutable pattern. As a, an environment scales and the, the more things can be different, the more variability you get in your environment, the more important it is to start shifting towards an immutable infrastructure. If you have uh, a cluster, uh, an application cluster of a thousand nodes, and a hundred of them have drifted because through your update patch, update patch, twiddle, tweak, change, fix as things break, process, um, you know, 50 of them fall out of drift, you start having interesting behaviors. You have applications that stop responding the same way. You have uh, variability that's very hard to track down and figure out what's going on. And even though we try and apply best practices with configuration management tooling, it's inevitable that this drift happens, particularly the more you scale. So with that, what is digital rebar provision? Digital rebar provision is essentially, it's a single Golang binary. It's super lightweight. We are 100% API first, and we do every enhancement or feature in an API, in Go first, and we dynamically generate the CLI from the API. So we don't try and um, reverse engineer the API with building a CLI that consumes the API. The API is dynamically, programmatically generated from the API. Very important distinction because it also allows us to have an API resource path that very closely follows the exact syntax that uh, the CLI has. So as you're developing and working with digital rebar provision, it's very fast and easy to uh, model how to do things in the CLI, and, which is you know, much more comfortable to do things at first, and then bake it into an API. Uh, API gives you the ability to integrate with external systems so that you can use other tools to drive digital rebar provision to drive provisioning workflows through what we call our composable workflow or stages. Stages is sort of what allows us to do a lot of the magic of what we do within our composable workflow. 
At the end of the day, we're a traditional Pixie DHCP provisioning service underneath the hood. We can't get away from that because all infrastructure is pretty much baked around Pixie DHCP for automation and provisioning uh, in one form or another. We also provide a web event system uh, for consuming uh, information and events coming off digital rebar provision. So it's very easy to integrate into other solutions. Uh, it's also pluggable. I didn't note that here on the slide, but it's pluggable so we can add plugin functionality to extend the capability of digital rebar provision in a number of different ways and directions, which enables it to be able to further integrate into environments much more successfully. Uh, like I said, it's a traditional DHCP service uh, where we have uh, TFTP DHCP to manage our PIXI process. We have an HTTP server that sits over the top of the TFTP environment. And, um, and then we have our API service, which runs uh, by default on port 8092, which is all the service API interaction. Uh, obviously, all of these ports are interchanged or exchangeable. With the exception of DHCP, TFTP, you typically don't change those because a lot of firmware is baked in with the assumptions on these ports. However, you can change them if you want. It's also important to note, uh, part of the Golang, single Golang binary, we don't have a great big, huge, fat external database service like a Postgres or a MySQL or some sort of key value service. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the dynamics and how we manage that and what we do there. Uh, that's a little further uh, down in the weeds, but it is an interesting thing to note because it allows digital rebar provision because of its super lightweight Golang binary and uh, lack of um, major external dependencies. I noted previously um, at the bottom of the slide, there are three things that we currently rely on, which is 7-zip, BSD tar, and unzip. Uh, we're working on getting those pulled out of the uh, dependency chain so that ultimately it is truly a single Golang binary with no external dependencies. Those dependencies are not yet fully realized in uh, full libraries in Golang that we've found yet to support the capabilities we need. Uh, one of the things that I talked about, uh, composable workflow, uh, we implement that through stages. So this is sort of an example of, of uh, a simple stage setup that might include both a mix of the open source uh, blue and the green uh, rack and uh, components and then say a customer specific uh, component. So you can interchangeably mix and match pieces that you obtain from the open uh, source digital rebar community content. Uh, if you have a commercial engagement with Racken, you could mix and match with our commercial components. Uh, you can create your own components and you can put these together in a workflow that allows you to define uh, how you want a machine, a single machine to drive through the provisioning process. So in this example, left to right, we have a discover stage where we'll, um, the machine comes up, we DHCP it, we inventory it, register it, uh, we might send out some logging or notification message. We move forward to a RAID and BIOS configuration uh, where we'll take that inventory information. Uh, we might apply and ensure that BIOS uh, versions are up to a specific date. We'll set up RAID configuration for a given machine based on its role. We might configure the baseboard management controller for the IPMI uh, function. Uh, then we chain next to the, the burn-in stage. We might, customer might have a, a burn-in workload. They want to verify CPU, memory, disks are good. Maybe a given application workload returns a specific performance level that we expect from a given SKU or configuration of a server. There's a number of variations that can happen there. And then last we'll do well, not last, we'll, we'll then follow up with the installation of the target operating system, either through an image deployment or through a traditional package deployment. And that can be anything from Linux to Windows to uh, anything you can imagine that can be done, automated for provisioning. Uh, we might grant SSH access as part of the install package path, uh, pass it to a post provisioning uh, stage after that, where we might um, note information back to a configuration management database or DCIM, or uh, we might note information back to IPAM. This is where you can integrate and do interesting things. And at that point, you would hand it off for production. So that's an example workflow. Um, our workflows are very flexible, and you can compose and dynamically choose various stages and put them together in different uh, ways and, and uh, methods to meet your requirements and mix and match them to meet your hardware and your given uh, goals for a given provisioning uh, workflow process. And like I said, 
API first, very, very important. Uh, we very much believe that the API is, must be the first class citizen because we generate the CLI from the API that makes our CLI a first class citizen. So there are no corner cases where the CLI doesn't cover what the API can do. Um, our UI or our UX consumes the API. So as a consequence, our UX does tend to fall behind a little bit in capabilities of what the API or the CLI can do, but it's still a, a fairly uh, useful and fairly um, broad encompassing tool. And again, I mentioned uh, we have uh, standard uh, web hooks and web events that we uh, integrate with. All of this means that it's very easy to do inbound or outbound integration. So inbound would be something like a configuration management service or a configuration management database that drives provisioning activities based off of hardware inventory or hardware information and defines roles and then drives provisioning workflows. Outbound would be, uh, say, for example, taking inventory and pushing that out to a DCIM environment so you have an uh, inventory management uh, with very fine-grained detailed information about all of your physical uh, server infrastructure. Going back to that cloud create destroy pattern, um, typically in cloud, cloud and, and container uh, provisioning solutions, you have a request for a given state, which is give me a VM or instantiate this container or load this container, and then the return state of did it succeed or not. So that sort of simplicity is what's been lacking uh, for the most part in uh, bare metal provisioning. And that's what Digital Rebar does. Through our workflow and our stages is we create sort of this black box uh, that the workflow sits in where externally you can make that uh, upstack request of give me a request to state provision this system with this given workflow and then tell me did it succeed or not. I don't care about the, the details of it. I don't want to know about that. I don't have any idea what those intermediate states and changes are necessary. Just give me this thing, tell me when it's done. And that's one of the, the, the primary goals about digital rebar provision is to make provisioning fast, simple, and capable and, and hide that sort of uh, reset, install, config, test, join, all of those stages that might exist in that black box. Some of the things that digital rebar provision also does is coordination. And coordination is not orchestration. Coordination, <clears throat> because we typically focus on specifically per machine workflow, we only care about doing something very well, very fast, very repeatably, very automatable for a given machine. And you might do that same thing over a thousand machines, but we want that one thing to work really well. We don't do cross cluster, cross node, orchestration, sort of. We do a little bit of coordination to help you with what we call basically uh, the cluster pattern. And the cluster pattern is there's a lot of services out there that has a master or minions or uh, primary and slaves or you know leader and follower, whatever you want to call them. And you have somebody that's responsible for coordinating the activity of a cluster. When you bring those clusters up, they typically have the same pattern which is you have some sort of secret that the master holds that the minions or the nodes that join the cluster must have to be able to support joining the cluster. Now, that, the way that's done reverses in some cases depending on the solution. For example, salt stack, the minion generates uh, a private key, and the public key presents the private key to the master, and then the master decides whether to select it or not as opposed to the master pushing a key to the minion. In this case, how we do the coordination, we do it on atomically so that we know that we're gonna have a master or a process that must occur first. And until that process completes, we're gonna lock the rest of the cluster so that it can't do anything and it must wait for the rest of its provisioning activities until the master process is done. So in this example, we have a master which provides a secret the secret gets recorded on the digital rebar provision endpoint, and then the minions pull the secret from the DRP endpoint. They present that secret to the master to typically do something like a join uh, configuration. So this allows us to provide atomic coordination, not full-blown orchestration of uh, basic cluster patterns. If we take that and we apply it to Kubernetes, 
we have sort of this basic bootstrapping illustration uh, uh, that centers around kubeatom as the solution. We have got four nodes, and we start out with a couple of stages. We install the OS, we install Docker. These are all stages that we'd walk the machine through. There's a selected master, and you can define which machine becomes master in advance, or you can just let the cluster elect the master, and we call it a race to master. Whoever becomes master first is the master. The master runs its kubeatom init, which creates a cluster token. The cluster token is uh, recorded back in digital rebar provision. And then the endpoints, uh, the minions then do a kubeatom join with that token, and they dynamically bring up a cluster. Later on, you can tie in an existing set of machines or dynamically expand the cluster using that kubeatom join process. So it allows us to create an instantly hydrated Kubernetes cluster with almost zero configuration aside from the basic setup on the digital rebar provision side. Outside of that, we can automatically deploy Kubernetes from master to all of the minions. Now it's important to note that Kubeatom doesn't really support high availability patterns yet, so we don't support that yet. So we get that question an awful lot because people go, oh, this is awesome. I want this in production. Now I want HA on my cluster. Well, until Kubeatom solves that problem uh, simply for us, then we're not going to be doing that. We do have uh, full-blown KubeSpray uh, Ansible playbook implementations that allow you to create full-blown HA clusters through the KubeSpray pattern if you want to do it that way. But that's outside the scope of this discussion. And that essentially gives us our token very, our cluster very quickly through that, that cluster pattern. And so going back to that shift left discussion. What does that really mean? Um, essentially, you have the problem, which is in an environment, you create a package, uh, create and package a server image, you provision the server, you set up the initial configuration, you patch it, you patch it, and you end up with a snowflake. And the madness doesn't really stop at patch two. You continue this process until eventually you have to replace the service and you're hundreds if not thousands of patch iterations later and that's bad because that creates snowflakes because eventually you get drift between large clusters large fleets of servers that it just happens that some machines don't get updated in line with a patch process and something goes wrong with a patch process and you end up with these snow snowflakes in large estates so let's take that same pattern and apply it to bare metal in an immutable way using sort of the cloud and container lessons. So now we have our package server image, provision server, initial config, or our running server. <clears throat> now we realize we need to apply some patches. Let's take those patches, apply them back to our original package server image, do our CI CD, our dev test, our pre prod, our acceptance testing, whatever that process and pipeline looks like in your environment, create version two of that, that packaged image. And again, when I say packaged image, that could be using traditional um, repos and kickstarts and precedes, or it could be an actual image. It's a raw image or a TFT or a tarball of the file system, whatever. And let's apply that cloud pattern, destroy it and provision a new server. Now, technically we might provision a new server, ensure that it's valid up and running, and then turn off the old server and the load balancer and turn on the new server and the load balancer applying our initial configuration. Those steps, you know, they vary from shop to shop. But essentially this gets us back to that sort of cloud and container pattern where we are um, applying patches to the left side of our workflow and not onto the right side of our workflow. And we continue that process on and on and on instead of patch update, patch update. A couple of pieces of information uh, about uh, immutable as we see it. Um, there's a couple of different patterns. There's a uh, live boot or in RAM memory. This is very similar to if you got like a, a DVD or a CD Linux distribution, you put it in your, your CD or DVD drive and you boot the machine up into a live mode. That OS is running in memory. We also see this pattern with things like uh, Rancher OS or Core OS uh, is an emerging pattern with some op, uh, distros in general. And uh, we can take and, and, and operate in this live boot pattern 
uh, through Pixie uh, Live Boot in, uh, into an in-RAM or memory image, and you then actually just reboot to apply updates. Very simple. You just reboot, and the next time you come up, you bring up the new image. Job done. It's very, very fast. There's no write to disk overhead. And if you're using uh, an image-based deployment, it's uh, or an image that you actually load as opposed to a package and uh, configuration uh, for one-time configuration, it's super fast. Downside is it consumes additional memory to run the operating system in, and it does make your provisioner a much more critical path component to your production operations environment. The second pattern is install to local disk. Uh, it's slower to install, but it frees memory resources and ensures that the provisioner is less critical to update operations. And so those are some of the different patterns that you may see with uh, live boot or installed to local disk. Um, additionally, like I mentioned, uh, this can operate with packages using repos, kickstarts, pre-seeds, whatever they happen to be. The problem is with this, this model is it's very, very hard to control your dependency chain, which packages and libraries are pulled in. Unless you own your repos and are very, very careful about controlling updates into your own personal repos that you do your provisioning off of. That is a pattern that can support immutable principles that you ensure what you intended to deploy, what you tested in your CI CD environment actually gets deployed to production and not six weeks later you've got 52 new package versions and libraries and all of a sudden you get some weird implementation issues. Uh, it is a very easy pattern to implement. A lot of systems administrators, DevOps, SRE types are very familiar. Uh, operators are familiar with this pattern, and there's a lot of uh, solutions out there to follow or examples out there to follow. Uh, the image-based uh, model has been around for a long time. I've personally started with image-based uh, as early as, I believe, 1999 with a product called System Imager. Um, so it's not a new idea. It's just an idea that's coming back around again, coming back into fashion, which can be a raw image, tarball, Windows image. Um, it's very, very fast to install. If you're doing install to disk, we can do very large Windows images in two to three minutes with only one reboot of the system, uh, as opposed to a traditional Windows install, which might take you forever <laughs> and lots of hair pulling and many reboots. Um, this pattern of image-based deploy uh, sort of a far left shift. So it's really pushing things way far to the left in that shift left pattern. And you get very strong guarantees that your production deployment uh, matches almost precisely your CI CD dev test environment. So you get very little variability in production from what you test and expect. Uh, so it's a very strong pattern for large shops looking to try and guarantee. Uh, that's it for the, demo, uh, the slide deck for me. I have a demo that I'll show for you. Um, if you have any questions, please, um, you can reach out to me, shane at rackend.com. I will post the slide deck to the meetup group. So if anyone's interested in seeing the additional slide deck, uh, you can take a look at that. And then also, um, there's some resources at the back of the slide deck that might be interesting if you're, you're interested in taking a look at digital rebar. Uh, we have a quick start document which lays the foundation for what we're doing in our Kubernetes rebar immutable bootstrap or what we call crib, which is what I'm gonna demo here in just a moment. Uh, we've got a bunch of slide decks that are basic training decks that sort of give you a, a quick bootstrap on digital rebar in addition to our documentation and then a whole host of resources. If you have questions or comments, or uh, you wanna get in touch with us, you can take a look at these on the slide deck. So if you give me just a moment here, we're going to try and tempt the demo gods today. Um, I had some significant hair pulling experiences with our hardware service provider yesterday with hardware problems. So we'll see how things go today. But today what I wanted to show you was our, our Kubernetes uh, rebootable or uh, rebar immutable bootstrap and through our digital rebar platform. And um, I need to also take a look at, um, I'm not sure where my controls are for questions. Um, Kristen, if you, Ah, there's chat, they hide it, okay. 
let's put my chat up. So if anyone has any questions, please drop those in chat uh, as I go along. So what I'm gonna, we're gonna show here today is we have six systems. They're uh, based in packet.net, which is bare metal service provider. Some of the problems I had with hardware notwithstanding, they've been an exceptional solution. We really like them at Digital Rebar because they follow cloud-like patterns as applied to bare metal service provider. Um, the first three machines I've already pre-set up into a Kubernetes cluster. And then what I'm gonna do is kick off the configuration of the other three into a second cluster. And because of the, the hardware problems, I wanted to make sure I had a cluster that's up and working for you. Uh, because what happens is the disks disappear on a reboot on some of these machines sometimes. And so our install to disk for the Docker uh, data directory uh, fails and that causes the, the implementation, the configuration to fail. Um, so let's take a look at how we do this. So how we define this in digital rebar provision is we have our set of machines, which I was referring to, our six machines. Uh, and we see that the first three are in a stage that I've called crib staged done. So this is the demo that I've pre-staged for everybody. And it's in this final stage. And if I come over here and, uh, oh, they make this really hard, toggle broadcast input. Let me turn off the broadcast input. Um, so here, if we log into our machines, we see we've got a whole bunch of processes, Docker processes and Kubernetes processes. Uh, and I have to spell Kubernetes correctly. And so Docker and Kubernetes is running here. And if we take a look at, <clears throat> uh, actually let's take a look at the, how we can interact with this cluster. So part of the, the, the solution is using what we call a profile to ho hold cluster state information, going back to that cluster pattern. And in this case, um, a, a profile that has not been used yet, which is our live one like this, looks like this. We just have a parameter called crib cluster profile that defines we're gonna be one of the crib clusters. Our change stage map is our workflow that defines how we step through the processes. And then we have access keys for access to the environment. So this is essentially a naked profile. And this is what a profile looks like when a cluster is done. We see that we actually get a crew, crew crib cluster join command, which is our kubeatom init command, we get a specification on who the master is, and we, then we have our base cluster profile. So this tells me that this cluster has been configured, but it also gives me the kubeatom join secret, which I can provide to bring other uh, machines into the cluster. And so that is sort of the basic backbone of the configuration that's necessary, not a whole lot that's necessary. Uh, but if we take and run a command on we simply run drpc profiles get, that's our CLI command, and we get the pr uh, profile name and we get the crib cluster admin dash config. Then we'll see what we get as the configuration. And let me pipe out the JQ so it's a little pr prettier. But this is essentially the uh, Kubernetes information necessary to define the cluster and interact with the cluster and the cluster secrets. So now if we do an export of the kube config to our comp file, we can now do kube cuddle get nodes. And now we see that the three machines, one, two, and three, in this case, the race to master, machine two, one, the master election, and the other two machines are just nodes enrolled in the cluster. So that is essentially what we're going to demonstrate here. We're gonna demonstrate that by going to our bulk actions. We're going to, um, and Stefan, I see your question. I'll get to that in a moment as soon as I get this kicked off. So what I'm gonna do is, and I'm going to apply the profile, which is my live demo profile, to these three machines. They were in a kube ready wait state. And if you watch um, the next step, I'm going to put them at the beginning of the workflow that says set to SSH 
Oh, it might be SSH access might be another one. Hold on, I have to check that. Um, but we set it to the beginning of the workflow. Yeah, so it's it's not SSH access. This is what I get for changing it at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, start crib live. Do, 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 do. Hmm. So much for demo, right? <laughs> there we go. I don't think it's going to kick off. Well, let's do this. Uh, I'm going to kick them back to crib ready state. Which is an extra reboot that I typically wouldn't want. Let's remove the uh, demo. So now we have in the profiles list, we just have a kube ready state, the shower. Let's take a shower and clean up, right? Something to that effect, I think, is what we're referring to in the shower icon. And then power cycle the machines. And we see actually the machines are powering down, the, the four, five, six machines are powering down. They're going to boot back up into the crib ready state. And we'll see them boot up as they go through their hardware refresh. And there they go. Uh, going to Stefan, so the question was, uh, which OS is supported, uh, preferred for the host system? Uh, we really don't care. Um, our, our demo here is CentOS 7. Our demo works equally well as an Ubuntu, on Ubuntu 16.04. Those are the only two that we've um, tested with any uh, regularity in the production environment. So uh, you can certainly create boot environments for other operating systems. We support other operating systems. Um, uh, their distributions as well. We have demonstrated using CoreOS in the past. We don't currently have CoreOS working in Digital Rebar version 3, which is the modern product version. Uh, it's on a roadmap to get working. It's not very hard to do. It's just something we haven't gotten around to. Um, this pattern actually replicates very fairly similarly what CoreOS is because our actual uh, distribution is CentOS 7 that we're actually doing a live boot from a Docker install to, and then a crib install, uh, which is setting up the Kubernetes cluster with kube admin pieces. So let's see if we take this uh, machine back here, we take the crib uh, ready profile off the machines. And the reason I'm taking this off is because they have competing workflows uh, for the purposes of staging the demo. I have to do it in two steps. And then we apply the actual uh, crib live demo profile to the machines. And then what we can do, since I had a question about what the heck I did at 2 in the morning, if we go and take a look at our crib live demo and our chain stage map, we can take a look at our chain stage map and we see that we start uh, with, and this gets JSON reorders things on us. So in that case, what we might want to do is go to workflow and go to crib live demo. And so our, re our workflow starts with start crib live, which is the, the stage I need to put the machines in, which is what I did wrong previously. Then mount local disks. So we mount a local disk, do our Docker install, do our crib install, and then we're done with the crib demo. So let's go back to the machines, select our machines. We have our, uh, our profile uh, crib live demo applied. Now let's set the uh, profile to uh, crib, Uh, yes, I, uh, start crib live. Thank you, Shane. Start crib. Somebody uh, cue me next time I forget. Um, start crib live. There we go. Now apply that start crib live stage and we should kick off and we're not kicking off. So what, what I'm going to do is 
take a look at what I did wrong in my demo uh, when I rejuggled everything last minute last night. Uh, what we can also do as a debugging troubleshooting step is we can take a look at our um, jobs log and we see that our jobs log finished successfully. So I've made an error in that stage somewhere. So I'll debug that. Uh, the takeaway though is from our uh, bulk actions, we can see that these first three machines were put into the crib staged profile and they were driven through to success uh, for completing the, the crib cluster. If anyone's curious what's actually happening behind the scenes on that, uh, the, the actual work that does the Kubernetes piece is the crib install stage. Crib install stage itself uh, has a task uh, very uh, uniquely named crib install. Uh, the crib install task itself defines a, a template and a template lets us create tasks that can reuse the same configuration in multiple ways through uh, Golang templating within the template. So if we take a look at the template, we, this is what actually happens. So we actually get our DRP CLI binary uh, CLI on the machine, to, which is our agent, to uh, help with the workflow process. Uh, we determine what OS we uh, are currently on. We do some package installs uh, and set up for Kubernetes. Um, and then we do some uh, uh, Golang templating stuff to get our information from the master, so the, uh, from the, the cluster. So we get our actual crib cluster credentials and information and we drop those into this template dynamically on the fly when it's instantiated. Uh, we determine who the master is. So if we don't have a master yet, we need to create a master. So then we uh, create a master uh, through the uh, kubeatom uh, init process. And then, so here's the actual kubeatom init process. And we take that information from the init process, feed that back into the DRP endpoint uh, through and then the next set of steps will be all of the joining commands for bringing nodes into the cluster and completing. So all of this can be decomposed into smaller templates to make it much more modular and much more configurable. Um, since this is just a, a pattern that we're demonstrating, uh, we didn't put a whole lot of productionization around that. But that gives you sort of a basic idea of implementing a very simple cluster pattern with what some people consider to be a fairly complex cluster-based solution. Um, so that's sort of it at the moment. Um, the last part, um, uh, Stefan had a question was, um, how much can the Kubernetes installation be customized? So essentially what I just walked you through, you can take a look at uh, the kubeatom uh, template that we use uh, for doing the actual crib install. And you can clone that template. You can make changes to that template that's uh, appropriate for your environment. And that allows you to do things the way you want them done. You can use it as a, a base um, starting point. We do work hard, as you saw, through some of the templating pieces to try and make our component reusable as much as possible by use of templating. So if you come up with some good, interesting uh, use case patterns or changes to that. We'd love to hear what those are and, we, and we're very open to pull requests to enhancing the content that's in our, our public repos and available uh, for yourself and also for everyone in general. And so we try and work very hard to compose or decompose um, problems down into small building blocks so they can be re rebuilt up in flexible ways. Um, the, the crib install stuff is not a very good example of that because we put it together very quickly for uh, demo, um, but hopefully that answers your question there. And then the last question uh, was uh, Project Calico. And in fact, we do, um, I believe we do have Calico stuff. Um, I think Calico is configured actually in the kubeatom. Uh, yes, so we have Calico actually running in the kubeatom demo here as the uh, software defined network components for that. Um, any other questions from anyone else uh, on online with us right now? Uh, if not, um, I will drop the presentation link into the meetup uh, groups so you guys can take a look at that. Uh, if you're interested in running through it, um, I'll sort out what I did wrong at 2 a.m. in the morning feverishly trying to clean it up so I had pretty names on my stages. 
and get that fixed and working and uh, make sure our documentation reflects those changes. Um, like I mentioned, uh, if you very quickly wanted to get started, rebar.digital uh, is the website that's a, a starting point uh, for um, getting us going, um, getting going with uh, Digital Rebar. Um, no further questions and uh, everybody, I really appreciate your participation is a pleasure uh, presenting to you guys. Kristen, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, hope they, hopefully, somewhere in the future, you guys are interested in some follow up uh, or additional, more detailed presentations or a rerun of this presentation if there's additional interest for it. Again, my name is Shane Gibson with the Digital Rebar Project and RackN at rackn.com. Thank you very much. Kristen, I think you're uh, muted there. <laughs> we both All right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Shane, um, for um, sharing um, your insights with us and for giving us this, uh, this nice demo. And thank you to all the others for coming. Um, as I said, we will share the, the video with, um, with the group uh, in the coming days via YouTube. And I wish you all a very nice day or a very nice evening, depending on where you are. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening or a nice uh, morning. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Bye.